Well, a phrase that we often hear these days is, we need to get back to the basics. And I was thinking about that and I thought, what exactly does that mean when we say get back to the basics? Well, basics actually is a phrase that means we need to return to the simple and the most important things. And I was thinking about this, even in uh, our schools today, I hear parents often say, can we just get back to the basics? I mean, could you please teach my child, you know, math and English and spelling and music and those things instead of teaching them about the new genders that are out, and, you know, there's so many now you can't keep up with them, or critical race theory or all those things, the agendas that the public schools are forcing upon our children. Get back to the basics. We also hear it in the sports world. I can't tell you how many people I have said, especially men that love sports, could we just play baseball, football, basketball? Do we have to bring politics into the sports arena? And you know, we have to bow to the flag or not bow to the flag or kneel or not kneel and just get back to the basics. But you know, ladies, I'm hearing it about the Church of Jesus Christ today too. Could we get back to the basics? How about let's hear the word of the Lord every Sunday? How about let's hear Bible teaching? Let's get back to the word of God and the souls of men. And yet in the church today, we see things like hip hop music, strobe lights, dancing, movies, drinking, and almost everything else you want to throw in there. We need to get back to the basics. You know, I find it fascinating that Christianity is always looking for new and novel ideas. And so as we come to chapter 3 of 2 Peter, Peter's going to say, we don't need any new and novel ideas, but we need to get back to the basics. And so he's graciously going to remind his readers to get back to what is important. Some of them evidently have forgotten some very important truths that they need to remember. And ladies, I would say that for us as well. We need to remember these truths. And so Peter's desire is that they will be willing to remember over being willfully forgetful. So let's hear what he has to say as we start chapter 3, and we're going to cover seven verses this morning, and also keep your hand in Genesis as well. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that scoffers are going to come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire till the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men." Now, as we consider the question, have you willingly forgotten or will you willingly remember, we're going to consider six things that Peter wants his readers to remember, six important truths that he wants them to remember. And my friend, you need to remember these as well, as well as I do. Now, as we finish chapter two of Second Peter, we answered three questions. First of all, What do false teachers proclaim? Remember, they speak great, swelling words of emptiness. They speak nonsense, basically. Secondly, we also looked at what do they promise? They promise liberty, freedom. You're not under the law anymore. You can do whatever you want. You have license to sin. Go ahead and party on. And so they promise them freedom. In fact, uh, we also looked at the what do they provide? What do false teachers provide? They provide a life that goes from bad to worse, a turning away from the holy commandments, and an eternity in the lake of fire. Not a lot of fun, right? They're dishonest, and we found out that those who follow him, follow them, the latter end is worse than the beginning. A dog is returned to his vomit, and the sow that was wallowing in her mire, she goes back to that again. So Peter's going to turn the corner as we get to chapter 3, and in contrast to the false teachers that we have been covering for a whole chapter, and I'm sure some of you are like me, we're like, 
We're glad that's over, as my husband used to say, all good Calvinists say, I'm glad that's over. And uh, so, but we need to know these things, right? And we needed to that chapter too. But we're kind of turning the corner a little bit. And so we're turning from false teachers to now the beloved ones. From the false ones in chapter 2 to the true ones in chapter 3. And so he begins with an admonition, a loving admonition. And he says, beloved, I now write to you this second epistle. So he begins by calling them beloved, which we know is a term of endearment. He uses this term four times in this epistle, and they're all in chapter 3. And it's interesting, each one of the times he uses the word beloved, it is always followed by an admonition. And uh, we've brought this out many times, and I will tell you as a former pastor's wife and, and a current biblical counselor, that that is very important when you're getting ready to admonish someone, uh, you want to do it in love. And so I don't ever say beloved, but I let them know with a spirit of gentleness that uh, I'm getting ready to say some admonition towards them. And so Peter does that, and so do other the, uh, other the apostles. And it's a very important principle uh, when you're getting ready, even to talk to your child about something, and especially your husband. It's a very good, important principle uh, to call him beloved or Lord or honey or whatever you want to call him. Um, ladies, it should be always done with a loving spirit. Well, after calling them beloved, he mentions, he says, I am even now at this moment, right now, uh, is what the Greek means, I am right now writing this second epistle. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate that we had in our first lesson. Uh, we brought out that there were two different opinions, whether Peter is writing to the same readers uh, that he wrote to in First Peter. I believe that's who he's writing to, but there's some other views on that as well. But I'm not going to get into that debate again. You can go back and listen to lesson one and you can debate all you want but I won't be there to debate with you so anyway but he does give the reason beloved I am now writing to you this second epistle and here's his reason this is why I entitled uh, second Peter with the master remembering precious truth because here's the purpose statement for why he is writing second Peter he says I'm writing this to stir up your pure minds by way of reminding you of something, of reminder. Now, to stir up your mind means to stimulate it so that it is fully awake. Ladies, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get up in the morning, I need my mind stimulated. In fact, this morning was one of those mornings. I woke up at 2.30, even though I had my alarm set for 3.45. But I woke up at 2.30, and I went ahead and got up, and I thought, boy, my mind needs stimulated. It's not fully awake yet. So I had two cups of coffee and uh, still wasn't quite awake, but hopefully it is now or we're in trouble. But... Um, we understand this in the physical realm, right? Sometimes our mind needs to be fully awake. They're dull. But Peter is talking about our spiritual minds. He's not talking about our physical minds. We need to be stirred up. We need to be refreshed. We need to be stimulated and reminded of those truths that we have forgotten. And notice he calls their minds pure. And you might be saying, well, how could that be? How could it be that my mind is pure? We still have flesh, right? Uh, I'm sure every one of you today have had something go through your mind that wasn't pure. So why is he calling their minds pure? Well, it's an interesting word. The word pure means to be judged by sunlight. And in the biblical world, what they would do often when a potter would make a piece of pottery out of clay, if it had some defects in it before he would sell it to a buyer, he would fill it with wax. And so when the buyer came in to buy this piece of pottery, he wanted to know if there be was any fillers in this vessel he was going to buy because if he bought one that had fillers in it, it would probably crack and break. And so he could see them and he could decide whether whether he wanted to buy the pottery or not, so he could hold it up to the light and see. That's what Peter is saying here. In the same sense, ladies, we as believers, we should have minds that are not covered up, not with wax, but with sin, 
we should be able to put our minds and test them by the light of God's word and who he is and see that they are pure. Now, that doesn't mean that you're never going to have an impure thought come into your mind. But when you do, you confess, you repent, and you move on. That's why we need to gird up the loins of our mind. That's why we need to transform our minds by the renewing of God's word. But Peter says, I'm, I'm writing this so you will stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So Peter wants to remind them of certain truths. And ladies, this is not a new thought. Peter set forth this principle, this truth, in the beginning of the epistle. If you look over at 2 Peter 1.12, remember where he said, for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you again of these things, though you know, you know these things. And you're established in the present truth. Peter even started out this epistle with the same thing. I'm writing this because you guys need to be stirred up. Your mind needs to be stirred up, and you need to remember some basic truths. We need to get back to the basics. And so now he's going to remind them of six things that they need to remember. And there's two of them in this first verse in chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Sorry. In this second verse of chapter 3. Sorry. Sorry. Told you I wasn't fully awake. You believe me now, right? Well, this is this is going on YouTube, but oh well, never mind. Okay, I was going to say, well, if it wasn't for that American Airlines and the flight getting in at 12:30, we'd be we'd be good to go. All right. So, verse two: that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets. Peter says, I want you to be reminded of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets. So, ladies, the first thing that he wants them to remember is this, the previous prophet, prophets, the previous prophets. Peter says, I want you to be mindful of them, of the holy things that were spoken by the previous prophets. In fact, if you look over at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, he wrote about this already. He says, we have the prophetic word confirmed by which you would do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Knowing this, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He's already reminded them of the importance of the holy prophets in the Old Testament. That's what Peter is saying here. He's emphasizing the importance of the Old Testament. And as we come to chapter 3, he wants them to remember what the prophets wrote of old regarding the end of the world and the judgment that is going to come. That's what he's going to talk about, the Lord's coming, along with the fact that the earth and everything in it is going to be burned up. In fact, Peter's not the only one that reminds them of this. Jude, which is kind of a sister epistle to Second Peter, we've looked at that a lot this year, especially in our homework. I've had you turn to the epistle of Jude, but Jude writes about this too. In Jude 14, he says this, now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, that's a prophecy from old, about this saying, Behold, the Lord is coming with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. You get the point? <laughs> ungodly committed. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude prophesied this too. He said, you need to go back to the Old Testament. This has been prophesied. What is yet to come has been prophesied in the Old Testament. And ladies, we need to take heed to the previous prophets. But it's not just the previous prophets Peter wants them to remember. Notice what else he says in this verse. He also wants them to remember, secondly, the appointed apostles. The appointed apostles. He puts it like this. And remember this, the commandments of us, this would include Peter, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter already wrote in 2 Peter 2.21 about false teachers who turned away from the holy commandment. And now he's saying what? Readers, remember us, the apostles. Remember the holy commandments we gave to you. Do not turn away from the holy commandments like false teachers do. And those who follow them, they turn away from the holy commandments. We, the apostles, 
we preach the holy commandments. And therefore, he says, remember the appointed apostles. Ladies, I don't know if you've ever noticed this in your Bible reading. And I do hope you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I hope you don't just pick and choose those favorite portions of God's word that you want to read. But if you ever come to the New Testament and you're reading and things, have you ever noticed how things point back to the Old Testament? And ladies, we need to realize that what the apostles are writing in the New Testament is a sometimes a fulfillment of what the Old Testament says, but a lot of it is they're just pointing back to the Old Testament. And so we look at that, and both are important. The previous apostles, I mean the previous prophets from the Old Testament, but the appointed apostles from the New Testament. In fact, Paul makes this very clear in Ephesians when he says this, um, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Listen to what he says. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the head, right? He's the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation of the church. He's the head. But also are the apostles and the prophets. Ladies, you would do well to stir up your mind to remember the previous prophets and the appointed apostles. Do you know on your lap or on your Bible app, whichever it is, you have 66 books in your sacred library. And do you know the advantage that you have over these readers that are listening to whoever is reading Second Peter to them? You have the opportunity any day, all day, to read these 66 books in this sacred library. We have such an advantage over the New Testament church, and yet most of us are biblically illiterate. Peter's saying, remember the previous prophets, remember the appointed apostles, and remember what they prophesied, the fact the Lord is coming, there's going to be a second judgment, the first judgment was with water, the second judgment is going to be with fire on the world, and it's going to melt everything in it. You know, for me, it's, it's a mystery to me. Um, how Christendom today gravitates to new and novel ideas, I don't understand it. Because I have 66 books here, and I don't know about you, but I have yet to master them yet. And there is so much more that I do not know. And uh, I don't know of anyone who has plumbed the depths and understood all 66 of these books, right? And if you have, then I want to talk to you after class. Because uh, uh, now that my husband's gone, I need to pick your brain because he's not here to pick his. So, but it always amazes me how, how women especially gravitate to other things, and not that those things are bad, but who has plumbed the depths of these 66 books? Who has mastered them? And so Peter says, remember this, readers. Remember the previous prophets and the appointed apostles. But now he mentions a third thing he wants them to remember in verse 3, and that is the shallow scoffers. The shallow scoffers. Notice what he says. Knowing this first, scoffers are going to come in the last days walking according to their own lust. Peter says, know this, remember this, this is important. Scoffers are going to come in the last days. Now, what's a scoffer? A scoffer is a mocker, a mocker. And Peter says they're willingly, in verse 5, they're willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant. They mock, they scoff at Christianity, but here they mock and scoff about the fact that the Lord is going to return. Just as the scoffers, remember we saw several weeks ago, the scoffers in Noah's day... <laughs> What do you mean it's going to rain? It's not. What is rain? What do you mean the earth is going to be flooded? They're scoffing. They were scoffing at Noah before that terrible day came when the flood came and wiped them all away. And remember Noah and his wife and three sons and their wives were the only ones that were saved. There were only eight saved. And so they're scoffers in our day too, aren't they? They're mocking at the Lord's return. Are you kidding me? The Lord is going to destroy the earth by fire. You expect me to believe that? And Peter says, remember this, there are scoffers. And Peter says, notice, they will come in the last days. Now, what is that? Well, the last days is everything between the first coming of Christ 
and his second coming. Everything in there is considered the last days. And again, Jude mentions this in his epistle, Jude 17. He says, you beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They told you there's gonna be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons. They cause divisions. They do not have the spirit. Now, I want to be fair. Some believe that the scoffers here are false teachers, uh, and it could be a reference back to chapter 2, But uh, because if you have erroneous doctrine, which we know false teachers do, that's going to lead you to erroneous what? Be beliefs. And so they would say, you're kidding me. Christ is not coming back. But I believe maybe more than likely the scoffers here are actually unbelievers who scoff not only at Christianity, but the fact that the Lord is coming back again to destroy the earth. And so, ladies, we need to remember the shallow scoffers. And notice what these shallow scoffers do, according to the verse. They walk according to their own lust. What does this mean? It means they live their lives indulging in their private lust. Ladies, that's what unbelievers do, don't they? I was talking to one yesterday, and I, you know, it's just shocking sometimes how unbelievers think. They're, it's all about them, you know. They're very narcissistic. It's all about me. What can I get in this life? What? It, they go for all the gusto. They walk according to their own lust. They're indulging in their private lust. We also saw, remember, when we were in chapter 2, that even false teachers have eyes full of adultery. They're just filled with lust. Their minds are not pure. But ladies, that's all, that also describes unbelievers. They don't have pure minds that need to be stirred up to remembrance. They have defiled minds. They have reprobate minds. They're filled with wickedness. Lusting is what they do. That's what unbelievers do. And not only do they walk in a certain way, but they speak in a certain way. Look at verse 4. Where's the promise of his coming? <laughs> Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues, just as it was from the beginning of creation. The word promise here means a divine assurance, and the word coming means his presence. He's going to come. Ladies, every eye will see him. Every eye will see him, but the scoffers are mocking. Where's the promise of his coming? Not only will they continue this, but they say, since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have since the beginning of creation. What are they saying? Nothing's changed. Nothing's different. Since our fathers fell asleep, and they're not talking about, you know, their father's going to take a nap. That's not what they're talking about. The word for sleep here is death. In fact, it's a, a similar and very and pretty much the same as the word in 1 Corinthians when it talks about uh, many among you have died or fallen asleep, uh, Paul says, because you've come to the Lord's Supper with a unworthily, in other words, with sin in your life and in your heart. And he says, don't come to the Lord's Supper in that manner because then he says that for this reason, many of you are sick and many of you have fallen asleep and it's not taking a nap in the back seat while everyone else takes communion. Many of you have died. And so this is what the scoffers are saying. Where's the promise of his coming? You know, since our fathers died... <laughs> Everything is continuing just as it was. Ladies, they're basically saying this. All things continue on. People live, people die. Flowers bloom, flowers fade. The sun rises, the sun sets. Seasons come, seasons go. And you're telling me that the earth is going to be no more and this Jesus is coming again? <sighs> you're crazy. You're crazy. Ladies, and we have people like that in our day, don't we? They scoff and they mock, and it's going to get worse. So that's some good news for this morning. You know, these guys would identify with Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes, some of the things that Solomon says. Remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 and 10? That which has been is that will be, and that which is done has been already done. Is there a new, any new thing under the sun? No. See, this is new. Everything that has been done in old times is done again. But, you know, Solomon had enough wisdom to come to the end of his letter more than these scoffers, and he says what? Here's the conclusion of the, old ma of the matter. After I've searched for pleasure and I built me, you know, vineyards and wine and I had women and I had everything I wanted in life, the finest food and everything, 
And as he sought for his pleasure and, and said, you know, it just seems like everything's the same, he says, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God is going to bring everything into judgment, every secret thing, whether it's good or evil. And so even Solomon, he had more wisdom than these scoffers. He kind of goes through that, like, you know, everything's the same. Is everything gets kind of like, like Groundhog Day. You know, is it the same? Everything's the same all the time. But Solomon had more wisdom than these scoffers. These scoffers have no fear of God. They have no desire to obey the holy commandments which were given to them. Well, Peter reminds them in the next verse that even though they're scoffing, they're in grave danger. What have they forgotten? Here's the fourth thing they have forgotten, and the fourth thing they need to remember. Our great God and his unwavering word. Our great God and his unwavering word. This is the fourth basic truth to be remembered. Look at verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. So these scoffers, what do they do? They willfully forget, or your translation might read, willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant of this. What are they willfully forgetful of? They willfully forgot that God spoke the world into existence. You know what they forgot? Genesis 1.1, what does that say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They forgot this. How could you forget that? They willfully forgot. They also forgot the rest of Genesis. Do you know God spoke eight times and it happened? It happened. They forgot that it said, God said there would be light, and there was. Let there be water, and there was. Let there be animals, and there were. Let there be vegetation, and there was. Let us make man in our image, and he did, right? They willfully forgot. And you know, some of us have forgotten that too, right? God spoke, and the world was created. These scoffers forgot their maker. They forgot the great God who created them. They forgot God gave them the ability to breathe. Isaiah 51, 13 reminds us, you forgot the Lord your God, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You've forgotten him? Ladies, I hope you haven't forgotten your great God and his unwavering word. In fact, Peter adds, this is a very difficult uh, portion to interpret, but he adds this, term, this phrase here. He adds, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. This is a difficult phrase to interpret, but basically what Peter is saying is this, that the water by which the earth was formed happened what? By the word of God. He said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the heaven, and there was. The water, this is very important, the water that God spoke into existence, what? Eventually destroyed, flooded, the rain came, came up, came down, flooded the whole earth. The fire that God is going to, however he's going to do it, we'll look at that in just a minute, is the same thing. Whatever God says, it's going to happen. The fire is going to come and what? Melt the whole earth in the second judgment. The first judgment, the first destru destruction of the earth was what? By water. The second will be by fire. And so Peter is saying the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And it really refers back to, if you want to turn back to Genesis um, this is a reference back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, where it's recorded for us. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw it was good. That's all Peter is saying. They have forgotten God. They forgot that God spoke the world into existence. They forgot that God was the one who said, let there be water, let there be a firm in the midst of heaven, let the dry land be gathered together, and the water he called seas, and the dry land he called earth. They forgot all that. And these same scoffers are willfully forgetting, willingly 
choosing to not remember that same God who spoke water into existence will be the same God who will speak fire into existence and destroy the earth once again. They're forgetting that. And ladies, I think some of us have forgotten that too. In fact, Peter's going to talk about it. We'll look at our next lesson. Seeing these things are going to happen, what holy manner of people ought we to be, right? And so if we really believed that the earth is one day going to be destroyed by fire and everything in it, do you think it changed the way we live? Do you think we would live each day as if it were our last day? I think we would, right? We don't know when it's going to happen. In fact, I don't know if you guys have heard the, since I've been home, but I've heard two really, really like sonic booms or something. I don't know what they were. I was like, is this the end? I'm going to go see Jesus and my husband. But uh, it was really weird. I don't know if anyone over in Bigsby heard that, but it was really strange. And I thought, I, I think this might be the end. It's coming right now because I'm preaching on it, teaching on it, you know. The teacher gets the biggest test. So, but anyway, uh, it was kind of an interesting time to kind of rein myself back in. Ladies, the psalmist also mentions this, and they should have known this, Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Well, not only did these scoffers willfully forget their great God and his unwavering word, but they also forgot the ferocious flood. Basic truth number five that they need to remember, as seen in verse six. Notice what Peter says. By which the world then that existed perished, being flooded with water. Ladies, God spoke the world into existence as we know. And we know what? But because man's thoughts were continually evil, it grieved the Lord that he made man. And so he destroyed man. Why? Because of their ungodliness, because of their wickedness. And so Peter says the world that then existed perished. It perished. Now, very important to remind ourselves the word perish does not mean that the world went out of existence what it does mean that all that was living at that time perished and we know these this if you want to turn to Genesis 7 it's very clear because uh, because Moses wrote it in Genesis 7 verse 17 he says this now the flood was on the earth 40 days the waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills were under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered, and all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, cattle, beasts, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died." So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground. Man, cattle, creeping thing, bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So when he's talking about it perished, he's not talking about the world perishing. He's talking about everything that was alive. Every man, every beast of the field, every bird, everyone except what? Noah his wife, his three sons, and his wife. We also know that Peter's not saying the earth, the entire earth was destroyed because after the rain settled, remember Noah and his sons, what? They started producing children according to Genesis 10. Well, Peter has reminded them not to forget the previous prophets, the appointed apostles, the shallow scoffers, their great God and his unwavering word and the ferocious flood. And now he reminds them of one more basic truth to not willfully forget in verse 7. Notice what he says. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire till the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Even though the earth was flooded, the heaven and the earth is what? It's now, Peter says, preserved by the same word. What's he saying? The same God that spoke the world into existence the same God that allowed the flood to happen is the same God who is now preserving the earth for what? <laughs> the day of judgment. He is holding it in his hands. He upholds all things. Paul says in Colossians, he upholds all things by what? The word of his power. And one day, 
it will be destroyed. Now the heavens here are, now some has wrongly uh, interpreted that the heavens here were heaven, are the heavens that God lives in. But ladies, that was never destroyed. Uh, in Genesis 1, it never says that the heavens that God lives in now were destroyed. When it talks about the heavens in Genesis 1, 6 to 8, he's talking about the firmament that he's talking about. There's three, you know, we have the sky, we have the atmosphere. We, Paul says he was caught up into the third heaven, so there's three. And so we know from Genesis 1, 6 to 8, in fact, if you want to, we looked at that a while ago, but the, when he's talking about the firmament in the midst of waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. It was so, and listen to this, God called the firmament what? heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. He's not talking about the third heaven where God dwells. The whole point of this, and I know this is, these are kind of challenging verses here to interpret. The whole point is this, the God who spoke the world into existence is the God who what? Spoke and it was flooded. That same God is now preserving all things. He's holding up all things. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews makes this clear in Hebrews 1. He says this, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. He bring the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And listen to this, upholding all things by the what? Word of his power. <laughs> Ladies, do you know right now if God decided to just give up, you'd be toast. <laughs> you would be toast. He's upholding the world, the word, the world by his power. And he will do that until the day of judgment. However, we know this world that we live in is one day going to be destroyed. Do not forget this, Peter says. He says, remember this. He says, the earth that was preserved after the flood, notice what he says, is now being reserved for fire till the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The words reserved for fire means to lay up, to lay up a treasure. Now, Peter does not say, where the fire is at this time. But he does say that the fire is going to destroy the world. Where is it laid up? I do not know. Some people believe the center of the earth is a ball of fire. I don't know. I've never been to the center of the earth. I don't plan to go there just now. So I don't know if it's a ball of fire. But you know what? The same God that spoke the world into existence can get fire wherever he wants, right? He can speak fire into existence if he wants to. Remember in uh, 2 Kings 1, when the story about Elijah, remember when Elijah was talking, he said, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And then what happened? Fire came down from heaven and consumed the 50 men. So God can get fire from wherever he wants to, right? In fact, uh, uh, John, remember when John and James were walking with Jesus, said, Lord, do you want to command fire to come down from heaven and blast this Samaritan village out of existence because they won't receive you? <laughs> and Jesus said, what? You don't know what manner of people you are. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy people, but to save them. But ladies, one day he will call the fire into existence. One man said this, God has all the varieties of fire that he needs for his purposes. The fire to burn wood, the electric fire of lightning bolt that strikes in an instant in the sky, the fire that burns in the sun, the fire to change the heavens and the earth at the last day, and another most terrible, unquenchable fire for the devils and the damned in hell, end of quote. Ladies, listen, if God can speak the world in existence, and I hope you really believe that, I hope you are not a scoffer. If God can speak the world in existence and form man from the dust of the ground, he can burn up the earth in whatever he, way he wants, right? He's God. We are not. One man said the earth is stored with fire, which will one day burst forth and consume everything. <laughs> End of quote. So Peter reminds them of a sixth important truth. He doesn't want them to forget the future fire. The future fire. It's going to destroy the earth. In fact, we're going to see next week when we're together, because of this, we should be living holy and godly 
lives. Ladies, this destruction of the earth by fire will be judgment, Peter says, on ungodly men. And this is only going to be the beginning for them. Once the earth is burned up with fire, we know there will be a judgment to come when all unbelievers, all shallow scoffers, will be cast into a different fire, right? The lake of fire, which is the second death. So to wrap it up, have you willfully forgotten or will you willingly remember? Have you forgotten the previous prophets, the appointed apostles, the shallow scoffers, your great God and his unwavering word, the ferocious flood and the future fire? Ladies, I would lovingly encourage you to stir up your pure minds and remember these basic truths. Willingly remember the previous prophets. Do you know the Old Testament is replete with basic truths that will encourage you and admonish you to walk worthy of your calling? As Paul says, these things were written for our learning that through Scripture we might have comfort and hope. Please remember the previous prophets. They foretold of the coming of Christ that, Lord willing, will be soon. But also remember the appointed apostles. Spend time in the New Testament reading the Gospels. Read the epistles. They will aid you in basic truths like how to have a God-honoring marriage, how to parent your children, how to love difficult people, how to serve the body of Christ, how to love your Lord more. Spend time in the apostles. Also, remember the shallow scoffers. Ladies, don't dull your conscience to the inspired word of God. Don't listen to the counsel of the ungodly as you might find yourself sitting in the seat of the scoffers, as the psalmist says in Psalm 1. And do indeed, I hope you pray for the scoffers of our day. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. And oh, may you never forget your great God who made you. He formed you. He knew you even before you were born. Don't forget this. Don't forget this, and don't forget his unwavering word. It is sufficient. It is authoritative. authoritative. It's inerrant, as we've seen already. In it is everything we need for life and godliness. Why would we turn anywhere else when we can have his word? Also, remember the ferocious flood. Remember the wickedness of man and the grieving of our Lord's heart was the cause of this flood. And remember the mighty power of God that can destroy what he has created in a moment. He can do it again. He will not be mocked. Last but not least, remember the future fire. Ladies, this should motivate you, as Peter will say, to live holy and godly. And we're going to see what it means to hasten the day of the Lord by sharing the gospel and praying with those who are lost. Ladies, may the future fire be a constant reminder to us to get ready to step into eternity. Remember these things, these six things, and be good to remind us also to remember Jesus's words when he says this, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be when the coming of the Son of Man comes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I know this is uh, this challenging passage to interpret, to teach, uh, to understand. It's difficult. And yet, uh, comically enough, Peter says Paul writes things hard to be understood. But he wrote some things that are hard to be understood as well. Pray that your dear Holy Spirit will give us the ability uh, to understand these things. Lord, I do pray that we would not forget them. Lord, I pray that we would not uh, forget that you have made us, that you have uh, formed us, that you have the power to destroy, you have the power to give life, you have the power to take life. And Father, just as one day you destroyed the earth with water, you will again destroy it with fire. And so, Father, I pray that would be a motivation for all of us to live holy and godly in this unrighteous world that we live in. Thank you for our time together, and I pray that as we go into our groups, Lord, that you would use the time for your purposes 
and that we would be able to stimulate one another unto love and good works. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.